Um, uh, uh, well, thank you, Boone, for all the nice words. Um, and so this program today is really kind of uh, set up for the um, beginner, people that have had some uh, maybe uh, relative success in planting their first couple of um, um, trees. They don't really know why or they've had some problems, but this is going to cover uh, the first three years of your plant and how to take care of them. So uh, we're going to go over site selection. We'll go over planting the tree, maintenance of that tree for the first three years, and then we're going to go over common questions and answers. And I thought the first thing we would do is go over a few terms that you might hear when you're reading about fruit trees or when people are um, uh, talking to you about fruit, fruit trees. So the first term would be temperate fruit. So what is temperate fruit? Well, it is the fruit that is adapted to the middle latitudes. It has a period of dormancy that is needed in order to bear fruit. And that's usually called chill hours. It has very cold hardiness. Um, they're best, the best known ones are in the rose family. And the palm fruit, there are two uh, classifications of temperate. One is palm fruit. That's the fruit that has the small core or the, the small seeds in the middle, like apple, pear, quince, and medlar. And then you have the stone fruits, and that's a fleshy fruit that has a stony pit uh, in the middle of it. And that's more like your cherry, peach, and nectarine. And then we have tropical and subtropical fruits. Of course, that's where they originated. They are evergreen and perennial. They do have a limited degree of frost resistance. Their growth is practically non-existent below 50 degrees, and they're very sensitive to anything below 68 degrees. And research has shown that all fruit trees require, an, uh, or all tropical fruit trees require a minimum mean temperature higher than 50 degrees as it's very coldest month. Now we're getting warmer, but we're, we still aren't getting there. They require humid conditions, and that would be a check for us. Um, subtropicals may suffer foliage loss during the winter. Now think of a fig tree. Fig trees uh, lose their leaves during the winter for us. And so you might think they're a deciduous tree, but they are not. They're evergreen and in the right temperature, they will keep their leaves year round. The major fruits for tropical and subtropical, of course, is banana and plantain, citrus, mango, pineapple. And then we have a host of minor fruits that are becoming more popular like avocado, guava, um, Sopadilla, passion fruit. Okay, now this video is uh, going to talk to us about planting your um, fruit tree, your um, tropical fruit trees. Um, these two trees are mango. This is an Alfonso and this is a Namdak Mai. Uh, the Nam Doc Mai is, oh, maybe five years old. I've had it in a container up until just this past spring when I purchased this uh, Alfonso. Alfonso was only about 12 inches tall. Um, I decided to plant them in soil because even though you can give your uh, container trees, a lot of care. The one thing you have trouble giving them are all the, um, the microbes that are in the soil. And microbes are very important. And as soon as you put it in the ground, it just pops. This has doubled in size. This one has almost tripled in size. Because they are tropicals, I will be providing them with a cover and uh, I have them close, to the, close together because I have a little greenhouse, it's a portable pop-up, and it will fit perfectly in this area. 
And so I can keep it covered every time we have a frost. Now, the thing to remember about tropicals is that when you hit about 50 degrees, they stop growing. So you might as well just cover them up. They also stop growing at about 85. That's why you don't see a lot of new growth during the summer. It's just too hot for them. So as these begin to mature, when they start blooming next year, I will provide them with some afternoon shade just to help keep them a little cooler than normal. Um, okay, we're also gonna go over um, the names of parts of the tree, just so we're all familiar. The roots, of course, are at the bottom. And that leads into the trunk of the tree. The crown is the top part and it's made up of leaves, twigs and branches. And then you have the bark, which is the covering. If you take the trunk and um, cut a slice of it, you'll see the outside is bark. Inside is the cambium and the phloem. And that's where all the nutrients go up and down. And then you have the sapwood, you have heartwood, and then you have the pith. Uh, another phrase you'll hear often is rootstock. And rootstock is that part of your tree, of course, that is underground providing the roots. Now that's not the same kind of tree um, that is growing above um, your, the ground. And um, we use rootstock for many different reasons. They provide us a lot of things such as uh, height regulation, uh, resistance to temperatures, um, soil pH adaptability, that type of thing. So 90, well, I would say at least 95% of the uh, trees that you purchase, all fruit trees are grafted. So that's underneath. The first roots at the top are your lateral roots. Those are very important because uh, they will keep your tree from wallowing around when the wind blows and uh, preventing small roots from growing. But most importantly, it provides oxygen for your tree. Roots need water, nutrients, and oxygen to grow. Above it, you have the soil line. Then you'll have the graft line. Above the graft line, you have the shoot, the trunk, or the scion. So this is our rootstock, and it's grown just like a regular tree. A bud from your desired plant is then grafted on. A little slit is made, a bud is put in, and then it, and it's taped on, and then it begins to grow. After it's a certain height, the rootstock is cut off and your preferred plant, your scion, begins to grow. Well, these are some examples of graph lines. And I'm talking to you about graph lines because they're actually really important to keep up with. And so here's one. You can barely see it, but you can notice that crook. Here's another. That was a wedge graph. Here's another, and you can barely tell the difference, but you can see there's a bit of difference in the texture uh, of the rootstock and the scion. Now, this one is obvious. You can see the scion, the graph line, and the rootstock. And I wanted to show this to you because you see this growth from the rootstock. Now, that is rootstock growing. And one of the reasons a rootstock is selected is because it's generally a vigorous grower. And so this growth must always be taken off. Otherwise, the rootstock can take over your scion and can often uh, kill it. And now we'll talk about rootstocks for a moment. Well, I thought we would take a second and just talk about rootstock. Um, there are a lot of uh, attributes that you uh, get from different rootstocks. Um, this tree is on Teresa, which is a trifoliata uh, hybrid. The attributes from this is uh, it's resistant to uh, Teresa. Uh, 
It is resistant to uh, Phthophora root rot, and uh, it has a little more cold hardiness. The negative of it is that it does not uh, really enjoy alkaline soil, which is what we have. So that's the negative, but you get more positive uh, from having it. The real positive is that it's a vigorous grower. These uh, trees on chorizo rootstock will be more precocious and they'll bear sooner. Now these three trees are all the same age. They're all eight years old. So why are they so different in size? It's because the one next to it, the Republic of Texas is on Flying Dragon. All right, uh, when we talk about rootstock, we uh, have a lot of attributes that they give us. And one of the things that we wanna make sure we always do is keep the rootstock from overtaking our scion. So when I say rootstock, I'm talking about the part that is underground and you can see the difference, the line where this scion was grafted onto the rootstock. It's a, just a faint difference in bark texture and bark color often. And so anything below that is not worthy of growing. You wanna keep it off at all times and then let your scion grow. Now our next tree is the Republic of Texas. This Republic of Texas is on flying dragon, also a trifoliata. But the importance of this rootstock is that it will dwarf your tree by 75%. You can look at the difference in this rootstock. It's pretty plain. This is the rootstock, here's your graft line, and here's the scion. Both of these trees were grafted eight years ago. Both of these trees have been in the uh, ground all this time, but you can tell the difference in size. Normally, Republic of Texas is a very vigorous tree. It can be, oh, 25 feet tall. But all I'm gonna get out of this tree is six feet, and that's all I want. This carrot carrot orange is normally 20 to 25 feet tall, but because I have it on chorizo, chorizo is going to give it about 20% dwarfing. So this tree will be maybe 15 feet. Now I can keep it even shorter than that by pruning out the main leader of each stem that comes up. And on this side of the trees, we have another dwarf, and this is the Ponderosa lemon. This Ponderosa lemon is its maximum height. Normally, it's a pretty large tree, uh, but it is on flying dragon. It is a lovely uh, lemon. You can see the size of the fruit. It's quite large, and it also fruits uh, just about year round. We have some blooms that are coming up. We have a very uh, immature right here. So you can have fruit almost year round, but it is not cold hardy. True lemons and true limes are not cold hardy. So you have to provide protection for them. Well, I thought well, we'd I take it. A... All right, to review on the rootstock, uh, sizing is very important, uh, so you need to consider what you want to do about uh, the size of the tree, and that is directly uh, in relationship to the rootstock. You can see if we look at apples, uh, we have the very dwarf that is usually used for um, patio or, or containers, and that comes in at about uh, six feet, and then the dwarf will come in at about eight feet, and then you have the semi-dwarf and the semi-vigorous. It's all uh, the rootstock that you're wanting. Now, when you're buying from a nursery, you're really kind of um, at the mercy of uh, whatever commercial grower uh, in your area is putting out. But if you're ordering online, often you can pick which uh, rootstock you're wanting. So another term that you'll often hear are chill hours. What are chill hours? Well, chill hours are that minimum cold weather 
that uh, is needed by fruit trees in order to go dormant and then bear fruit in the spring. And we call them chill hours. It's, um, there are about five different ways of calculating it. Uh, we actually use the, um, the moderate 45, which means we count hours between 32 degrees and 45 degrees. When you buy a fruit tree, you should just quickly look up online what are the chill hours for that fruit tree. Um, because let's take a peach, for instance. A peach tree can go everything from 150 uh, chill hours to 1,400 chill hours. The normal chill hours for our area is around 450, um, probably more like 400. So you should pick something less than 400, like 250, 350, and then that would um, more or less ensure that you would have fruit. If it's 1,400 or uh, 500, even 600, you will not get fruit and your tree will be unhealthy because it doesn't have that dormancy period that it needs in order to grow properly. And now we'll talk about a little bit about that chill hour. When we talk about growing fruit trees, one of the most popular fruit trees for uh, people in Fort Bend County are apple trees. Everyone wants an apple tree. Unfortunately, apple trees uh, are best grown uh, north of us. And it's simply because apple trees need a certain amount of chill hours in order to uh, produce. Now this is, this tree is a graft of two different varieties. One is uh, Golden Dorset and the other one is Anna. These are really the best apple trees for this area. You can get other apple trees, but they're just not going to perform well. These apple uh, trees are reliable and they'll give you fruit every year. Now, one of the other trees that uh, has been on the market for a while, it's a hybrid, it's a sister of a pink lady. Uh, it's called the Sundowner. And we've learned a lot. Um, it grows very well in California because they have very consistent weather there we don't have such consistent weather. It's a low chill uh, apple, so by rights it should do well here. But after many years, we found that these do not bear fruit here because um, they need a very long, hot summer in order to trigger them to put on fruit. And so they want to bloom in the fall. And then the other peculiarity about them is that they absolutely cannot take freezes. Any freeze will uh, put them into shock and then you're starting over again. So this is a tree that I would not recommend for our area because although our winters are becoming warmer, uh, we still have enough of a cold, like under 50 degrees uh, during the winter to keep them from bearing fruit. So this one's going to leave uh, my garden and I will replace it with something else. All right, just to go over a few basics. Uh, insight selection, we need to think about sunlight. Fruit trees are going to need at least six hours of sunlight daily. And then we talk about soil. Soil is very important and you should have a soil test done to determine what your pH is and what nutrients you have and what nutrients you lack in your soil. pH is very important. Some trees absolutely will not grow in alkaline soil and some absolutely will not grow in acidic soil. You should also consider good drainage. Trees are basically killed by too much water and not enough water. And that's the bottom line. So think about if you don't have good drainage, you need to do a container, a raised bed, or a berm. And you need space for that tree to grow. You need to think about the diameter of the mature tree because it will be mature way before you think it is. Um, it needs to have good air circulation to decrease the possibility of disease. And you need to be able to get around it 
to do your maintenance. So when you've decided to buy a tree and plant it, you need to really give some consideration to site. Uh, where are you gonna put it? Look up, do you have wires? because in about six years, that tree could be hitting those wires and you have to cut it down. Also, you should make sure you have no uh, irrigation, no plumbing, no um, cable uh, line going through your yard where you're about to uh, uh, dig. The other thing you wanna do is check the sunlight, make sure it's gonna get enough sunlight through the day. And then you wanna check the quality of soil that you have. Now, most of Fort Bend County is alkaline soil. Most of Fort Bend County is clay. There are some nice areas that have uh, river soil, but mostly it's clay, like this right here. And so you can see it's clumpy and it's difficult to work with, but clay actually gets a bad rap sometimes. It's a good soil. It holds on to nutrients, it releases them slowly, but the other thing it holds on to is moisture. So if you have clay soil, you may want to consider raising your trees up into a berm or into a raised bed. And this is a berm. You can see it's, it's not intrusive. It's a slight rise. In the middle, it's going to be about 12 inches above the clay soil. And this will encourage our tree to put out roots quickly, and then it will also send those anchoring roots down into the clay. When I'm ready to plant and I've, I've decided on a site, the first thing I wanna do is a retention, a water retention. So I pour the water in uh, into a hole that's about 12 inches deep, uh, let it absorb, and then I pour more water in and come back the next day. If there's clay, then I know I have to raise the soil level or move to a different area. And the other thing that's always a good idea is to have a soil test done. What is your pH? What is your organic matter in the soil? What nutrients do you have and what nutrients do you need to add? So we've done that and now we're ready to plant our tree. Now I've dug a hole and what I've really have dug is a donut hole because I want the center of this hole to be firm. I don't want my tree to sink once I've planted it. So I have my donut hole, it's nice and, and deep, and now I am ready to plant my tree. And so this is the tree that we're going to plant today. It's a guava tree. Now again, this is kind of tropical, but I, this is in a nice place. I have it against a fence, that's going to act as um, some uh, winter wind protection. I also have it under this tree somewhat so that it will uh, be able to uh, have protection on uh, frost. And guavas like to start their life out as understory trees. I also have an old uh, compost bin that I'll be using for winter protection. So I'm confident that this guava will do well in my soil. So the first thing I want to do, of course, is tip out the plant. And so I do that by gently tugging until it comes out. There we go. And then we wanna look at what we have. Now these roots look great. You can see the little white tips that are growing. I don't see anything circling. If I did see something circling, I would cut it off. You never want to leave circling roots. Now, the thing to know about this is that this is not soil. This is not soil. This is a potting medium. It's a growing medium, and it's mostly made of, of wood chips and um, just various things. So we're going to gently remove as much of this soil or this mixture as we can without really damaging our roots. And one way to do it is to just dump it in a bucket of water and give it a little swish. Now, if, you're, if your tree has been sitting at the nursery for a while, 
you may find that it has a lot of roots that are twisting and turning. And if you try to get the medium out, you will find in here, you'll have a lot of twisting and turning roots and you wanna cut those. So I'm looking, this looks great. Looks really, really good. I've gotten most of the soil off. So now I'm gonna put it right in the middle on that little platform and I'm gonna spread the roots out. I'm gonna give them space and make sure they're nice and, and straight. Then I'm going to bring in the soil that I dug out and I put in this bucket, bring it up about halfway and then you want to just water it in really well. Let that soak in. Then you want to bring in more of the soil that you dug out. Now you don't want to add any amendments. You don't want to add any fertilizer at all. No sand, nothing. You just bring it in, bring it around, water it in again, very well. Here we go. And bring the soil up. Now, we want to make sure that we have left our first vertical roots, our lateral roots, which are right here. We want to make sure those are just under the soil. That's important. This tree not only needs water and nutrients, but it needs oxygen. And if you bury your roots too deeply, you'll be cutting that oxygen off. Now with our soil that we have left over, we're gonna make a berm, which means again, a berm is just raised edges. And that's gonna capture the water that uh, we're gonna be putting in here. Then we take our mulch. Now I use, as you can see, I use leaves for my mulch. And so we'll bring the mulch in We'll bring it up to our planting point and just a little over. Okay, we don't want to bring it up to the root. We don't want to bring it up to the trunk, I mean. We want to just bring it into that depression. Now, the last thing that we do is we plan for watering. And here is the little instrument that I like to use. You can see it's just a soaker hose or a drip hose. We have uh, an inlet on one end and a stopper on the other. And you just wind it around the tree several times. And I have a little stake, but I don't see it now. So I'll use this to stake it. Then wind it around. And then you hook the water hose up to this end and you can just let it sit and drip and drip and water your complete uh, area. You wanna water the area you've disturbed. You want to uh, water the area that you've um, brought in. You wanna water the area that your roots are in. So it all needs to be watered. I'm going to add a little bit more. There we go. And now we have this fine little tree planted and it looks great. I'm not going to stake it because um, the canopy is not heavy enough to need staking. Often if you have a tree that's, you know, maybe two feet tall with a canopy on the top, you might want to stake it because of the wind. But a little tree like this doesn't need staking. It will, in fact, do uh, even better if you don't stake it because the wind will um, move the bark, move the trunk, and help it uh, grow stronger. Thanks. 
Well, to make a, a, a quick synopsis of that, uh, before you plant your tree, you do want to do a water retention, and that's dig a hole 12 inches deep, fill it with water, let it drain, refill it, come back in 24 hours. And if you have mud in that uh, bottom of the hole, or if you're still uh, retaining water, then you know that that is not an ideal area. So you would want to build a raised bed or just build a berm, as I was showing there or put your plant in a container. You also want to do a soil test. And this is the uh, website you can go to. They will send you instructions on how to do the soil test, give you uh, the form to fill out, and give you the address to send it to. Now, just a quick review. Um, we want to dig a hole that is wide, but relatively shallow. You want to have a, a portion of it that's undisturbed in the center because after you rinse the potting medium off the roots, you want to set them on that platform and spread the roots out, making sure that your first lateral root is only one to two inches below the soil. You'll then bring your soil in, water it halfway, water it, bring it in the rest of the way, water it in, and add your mulch. Your mulch should not go all the way up to the trunk, but should be a good six inches away. And then when it's watering, this is the uh, mechanism I use. This is a soaker hose. I use a drip hose. Very easy to make, and it ensures that your tree will have enough water because you want to water at least 12 inches. You want that uh, entire area to be wet. And this diagram shows you on your more mature tree, on your trees that are two or three years old, you want to make sure that your water, uh, your fertilizer, everything goes to the most uh, amount of roots that can take advantage of them. And that's going to be drawing a little uh, triangle from the drip line over to the trunk and then out toward the um, area. You want to make sure you have a good mulch on there, three to four inches. You want to keep it away from the trunk. And when you feed and water, remember it goes beyond the drip line and then in toward the trunk, but not at the trunk. If you just place your water hose here, you're really not doing any good to your tree. So now we're going to talk about a rule of thumb. And I'm sure you've all heard uh, when you ask, how much water does my plant need? Or how much water does my yard need? Uh, the answer is always, it needs about an inch uh, every week. And well, what is an inch? The quick math solution for it is, if you have an area, a 12 inch by 12 inch area by one inch of water, then that's a square foot of water. And that equates to 0.623 gallons of water. So if you're watering an area that is like a four foot by eight foot area, you would actually need about 20 gallons to give you the one inch that you need. Now, watering, watering and soil type is very important. Clay will hold more water. It's slow to absorb and slow to release. With sand, the water just pours right through. And with loam, it's a good in-between mix. The diagram at the bottom will kind of give you an idea that sandy soil uh, has very large pore spaces. And so to get your water 12 inches down, it's going to take you maybe 15 minutes to water that area, but you can see the area that is um, absorbing the water is a very small area. Whereas clay soil, the depth of 12 inches may take two hours to reach, but it waters a much larger area uh, of soil. So keep that in mind, your watering depends really at how long 
to water depends on the type of soil that you have. When we're talking about site selection, one part of it, of course, is the amount of sunlight your plants will receive. These two plants are cherry of the Rio Grande. They were planted at the same time, they're the same age, um, but you can see there's a huge difference in their growth. This plant I did not protect the first winter and it froze back, which knocked down its, its growth a bit. This one I did protect by banking soil around the trunk in order to protect it. This one, remarkably, just a, a foot, a, a yard apart, receives only four hours of sunlight a day because of our lemon tree, four hours. This one, still close, but always receives at least six hours of sun a day. There's a big difference in uh, the sun and how it will help your plant mature and grow. If your plant needs full sun, then give it at least six hours a day. So what to do about planting? Well, your temperate trees, you can plant those in the fall and in the spring. Um, in the fall, it gives them an opportunity to put on uh, new roots, but and remembering that they will go dormant. You don't want to plant your semi-tropicals or tropicals until April because they are evergreen and they need a warm soil in order to prosper. All trees need to be hardened off before they're planted. Now you think about the conditions that your tree has grown in. It's been in a greenhouse. Uh, it's probably been in a shaded area. It has some shade cloth over it while it's sitting out for you to come and buy it. It's not used to that harsh sun. Additionally, they're being watered every day. They're being fed every day. So you need to harden them off. And you do that by gradually giving them full sun exposure. You don't just take them out and plop them out there uh, and plant them. Now, if it's a temperate, yes, you can go and plant it. But you still have to pay attention to the bark. Tropicals should be kept as container plants or planted in a sheltered area, just as I was showing you with that guava. That guava tree is a Mexican guava, so it already has a bit more uh, cold hardiness than the Asian guavas. But still, I had protection for it, uh, a wind block and a frost cover. You want to concentrate on drainage. I can't say that enough. Trees do not want to set in wet roots. Full sun is best, but often you're gonna find a benefit by giving them protection from afternoon shade. Our sun is very hot and it can be relentless on sensitive young plants. You wanna monitor your watering amount. Transplant shock. This is probably the one question we get all the time. What's wrong with my tree? You can see this is a newly planted tree. It still has the tag on it. You can also see that they did a very good job. They removed all the sod. Here it is piled over here. So all the grass, all the competition for the nutrients and moisture have been removed. Uh, they've planted the young tree. I can't see the roots, so I don't know if it's been planted too deeply, but I can see that it is wilted and suffering. So newly planted trees are subject to stress-related problems, and that's because they either have root loss, they've been planted too deeply, and so they have a lack of oxygen in the soil, or the soil temperature is too low. Fruit trees have a high root oxygen requirement and roots function best at oxygen levels above 10%. Now this can be affected by the soil being waterlogged or compacted or too cold. The quicker the soil warms up, the quicker the roots will start to grow. Cold and wet soil is not good for newly planted trees 
and I'm talking about your more tropical and semi-tropical. If you're planting a dormant tree, then uh, cold soil will only give it a uh, delayed time of growth, but it, it won't affect it as badly as it does the semi-tropical and tropical. And transplant shock results in increased vulnerability. So pruning, we've all uh, discussed pruning that tree off when it's first planted. And why would we do that? Well, we would do it if we have less root system or if we have a dormant root system. Uh, and the reason we do it is bare root trees have lost the majority of their roots. Or um, if you have a tree that's uh, in a pot and you take it out and all the roots are wrapping round and round and girdled and you have to remove a number of those roots, then you have a less root system and it's going to suffer water stress because the crown loses water faster than the root mass can absorb it. Water stress reduces the ability of trees to produce energy, diminishes the overall growth of the tree, and subjects it to many environmental and pest-related problems. Altogether, that's transplant shock, and if it's not taken care of, it can kill the tree. But all bottom line, it is not recommended to prune your trees unless you're establishing it in a particular growth pattern. And what, what would those be? Well, one would be um, open vase or bowl. And you can see that the, the tree in this diagram is trimmed back, everything's cut off, and the tree is left at about 28 inches in height. And then in the summer, more trees are trimmed off, and you can see at the end, it looks like you have an oak, the limbs are opened up. Those are called scaffolds. They're opened up and a lot of sun comes to the center of the tree. Another particular uh, pattern is the leader or the modified leader. And that's where you have one trunk going straight up with scaffolds coming off of it. Now, this um, system is usually used for apple, pear, and persimmon. And the open uh, vase or bowl is used for peach, sometimes apple, plum, and nectarine. All right, pruning is an integral part of any orchard. You prune to have a healthy tree. You take out uh, crossed limbs. You take out unhealthy limbs. Uh, you take out limbs growing downward and you take out the ones going straight up. Those are the water sprouts and they're not going to bear fruit for you. There's also uh, pruning for size. Now, um, this became pretty popular several years ago. And so I decided to experiment again on one of my trees. And this is uh, one of the things I do is uh, I try to push them to their limits to see what they do. How will they grow? So this is uh, an Atlas Super Orient pear tree. Uh, I did not know when I bought it that it will grow to be 40 feet tall and about 30 feet wide, which is entirely too much for me. It would also produce about a thousand pears a year. So I decided to cut it down as a mature tree to trim it back and to see if I could um, keep it as a smaller tree. So you live and you learn. Uh, what I found is that yes, it is possible to do, but it is also really hard on the tree. It is difficult to maintain because of course, every leaf is sending uh, all of its energy down to the roots in the fall. And then in the spring, when the tree is ready to put leaves on, that energy is coming up, it's looking for an outlet. If it doesn't have a branch to go to, it will produce a branch. And those branches tend to be water sprouts that are weak and unhealthy. So then you have to go back in and prune and prune and prune to keep those off. What I have found uh, is that when you're pruning a tree and you're trying to bring it back, you should make a plan for three years at least. So the first year you're gonna take off 
a small, maybe a third. The second year, you'll take off another third. In the third year, you'll have it down to where you want it to be. And when you take off your third, it doesn't always have to be like from the outside in. It can be one entire limb that you're going to take off, and that could equal a third of the tree. But you want to take your time. You want to uh, allow your tree to heal before you prune it again. Otherwise, you can bring in disease and you can sometimes uh, kill your tree. So this tree and I have uh, come to a, a resolution. I'm not going to prune it anymore and it's not going to grow like crazy because now when I want to uh, impede its growth a bit, I just do some root pruning and that helps even more. All right, now we'll talk a little bit about feeding. So why do we fertilize our trees? Well, we want to promote growth as early in the season as the tree is able to take up the nutrients. We want to maintain a healthy canopy through the first frost. And we do that by uh, putting the nutrients and the moisture in this on the soil where all the roots or the most roots can reach it so uh, one caveat of course are the tree stakes when you put a tree stake or when you dig a hole and you put fertilizer in that hole you are just affecting the roots right around that hole but if you broadcast and you work in your uh, fertilizer or you, or you uh, make sure that your moisture is in a large area, then you're being able to treat as many roots as possible. Our nutrient goals for our trees would be to build our soil and let it feed our plants. Feeding is best done by microbial activity. Now you can look at the diagram or the picture next to it, that's a tree that's growing in soil. And all those little things you see here are microbes. The tree's roots are here and these are microbes. The microbes break down organic matter in the soil and they release nutrients for the plants. The plants in turn will feed microbes with, with um, an excrudent from the roots to promote microbe growth. So here's another rule of thumb when you're talking about fertilizer. Now this does not apply to, let's say a thin layer of an organic matter, such as hardwood mulch or a, a good compost. This is referring to uh, a product, a urea product, uh, chemical inorganic fertilizer. And so most of those are salts and any application of salts to newly planted trees can compromise their establishment because it will burn their uh, roots. Trees should demonstrate new leaf and shoot growth before applying any fertilizer. So for the first year, if you don't see this tree really growing, don't fertilize it let it work it out. Second year, you want to fertilize the tree if the growth is vigorous. Do not fertilize before May or after August 15th. So what do we feed them? Well, remember that is based primarily on your soil test. That test will tell you what nutrients you need and in what amounts. But as a rule of thumb, for sandy soils, you want to use a complete fertilizer. That's where you have three numbers. You have those three numbers and you have an amount in each of those numbers. So for fruit trees, 15, 5, 10 is a, a good fertilizer. You want to use one pound per inch of truck diameter for every year of the tree up to 10 years old. And you want to use one pound for every 10 feet of blackberries or grapes. Now, if you have loams or sandy soils, the only element you really need as a rule of thumb is nitrogen, because remember clay soils hang on to nutrients. So one pound of 
uh, nitrogen, such as 2100. One pound for every inch of trunk diameter and every year of age up to 10. And then you want one pound for every 100 feet row of vine crops. And when do we feed? Well, in semi-tropical and tropical, you wanna wait till the temperature is like 60 at night, uh, 80 during the day, which usually happens in April. And so you'll want to feed April, June, and October. In temperate, you want to do it in, they've devised a clever way uh, of feed reminding you to feed in February, May, and June. And that's Valentine's Mother's Day, Father's Day, and that's called the Sweetheart Schedule. Well, now we're at the point we're gonna talk about some common problems that we hear on the hotline and our answers to them. So we get pictures like this often, and the question of course is what's wrong? Uh, these trees have either received too much water or they have not received enough. The symptoms are exactly the same on all three, because when you water too much, the roots become clogged up and they cannot uptake moisture. And when you haven't watered enough, it's the same thing. We also get this question quite often. You'll look at this leaf, it's yellow. There seems to be a green triangle right down the midrib. And you can see it's forming on this one. Yeah, here it is on this one. This is generally the, the, the uh, sign for chlorosis. And, um, Iron deficiencies are common in alkaline, high pH soils. Now that's what we have. Neutral is like, you know, 6.5 to 7.5, and most of us have uh, much higher pH than that. High soil pH makes iron chemically unavailable to plants. So it's not that your soil does not have iron, it's just that the plant can't take it up. As a rule, the iron deficiencies tend to diminish <clears throat> as soil temperature increases and moisture decreases. So that's a problem we have in our spring. And usually we have a very cold, wet or a cool, wet spring. So you'll see lots of chlorosis. You can either treat it or you can just wait and it will take care of itself. However, if you have plants that require acidic soil, they're never going to completely recover, uh, regardless of temperature or moisture. In that instance, you really need to add sulfur in order to acidify the soil. Foli foliar iron sprays do not work well to correct iron deficiencies. You really need to use iron shelates. Iron sulfate is seldom effective as a remedy, whereas uh, Iron deficiencies um, are uh, where they're a problem is when you have clay soil and you've been using, let's say, a balanced fertilizer, one that says 10, 10, 10. You're actually adding too much phosphorus and too much potassium to your soil. As this builds up, it makes it more difficult for iron to be uh, available to your plants and you will see more of the chlorosis. So if you discontinue the uh, phosphorus and potassium and just uh, fertilize with the nitrogen, you should see a, a, an improvement in your plants. Nitrogen deficiency causes plants lower leaves to turn yellow, while excessive amounts delay maturity, causing increased vegetative growth and decreased fruiting. Basically what that means is Nitrogen or fertilizer is not the answer to every single question. Uh, if you have a tree that has been putting on some new growth and suddenly those uh, lower trees are starting to turn yellow, um, there's really no reason to start throwing the fertilizer at it because if the soil is still wet and it's still cold, that nitrogen is just going to sit there. The, the tree's not going to take it up, it's not ready to take it up. So what it does is it will move nitrogen from the lower mature leaves 
and move it up the plant into the immature new flush that is coming on. So the other thing that we need to remember to do is to scout for bugs. And what we need to do is to know what we're seeing. If you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know whether you need to kill it or not. So we here we have white fly, we have scale. This uh, might look like mealybug, but it's actually a woolly scale. This is a hard scale. This is damage from a citrus, uh, Asian citrus psyllid. They give a peculiar and indefinite look to leaves. These are aphids. You can see they're quite small. These are male aphids here, and they look completely different. And these are spider mites. You don't often see the webbing, but sometimes if it's a bad enough infection, you will. So what should you do? Well, you want to monitor your leaves. Go out and look at your plants. If you see a bug, you can hand pick it or just squish it. And if it's a small plant, you can simply wash them off. If you have scale, you can use a soapy water and a, a toothbrush. And if you have aphids, just a sponge will work. And sometimes the environment will affect our plants. So the Damage you see on these nice satsuma over here, that's actually bird damage. They'll, uh, grackles are really bad. Mockingbirds will do it also. They like to come in and they peck the rind because they're taking the oil um, from, the, from the plant. They rarely peck all the way through the rind. Sometimes you'll see this damage if your plant has uh, thorns on it. And when the wind blows, the, the plant will be hit by the thorns. This damage is sun scald. It's sunburn. Uh, it happens often if we trim off uh, a top branch and suddenly those internal branches are exposed to the sun, then the leaf will burn. It happens if we put them out without hardening them off. It happens for a lot of reasons. Um, this is a wind scar. When the fruit was very small, uh, wind blew it and it hit next to something on the limb and made a tiny little scar. And as the rind grows, the scar grows. In the middle, we see what happens often when we've had kind of a dry period and then suddenly lots of rain. Um, that's one reason it's important if your fruit tree has fruit on it, make sure it's getting sufficient moisture. Don't let it get too dry because a quick rain will make the fruit split. This is a little satsuma that has just been left on the, the tree too long. You can see it's pulled away and dried up in the middle. Satsumas are actually ready to pull when they're green with just a, a flush of orange beginning on them. If you wait till they're completely orange, you're gonna lose the, the quality of the fruit. This is a Katie did bite when the fruit was very small. This damage was done by a leaf-footed bug or a stink bug. You often can't even tell that there's going to be damage until you slice it open. And this is a very common sign for plum curculio. They're going to attack your peaches, your nectarines, and your plums. And they always look, uh, it looks like a little bit of sap a clear sap, and that's your curculio. Uh, and then we have the sun skull problems. Now trees will just sometimes defoliate. Um, could, because, could be because the weather's too cold, could be because it's too hot. It could be because it's overwatered or underwatered, or it could be because it's just gonna put on a new flush of flowers or foliage. But the problem, is that it, your uh, bark that was protected by these leaves are now uh, open to uh, the harsh sunlight and will burn. The bark will, will crack. Over here, you can see this is really a very good example of sunburn. It, this area of the um, trunk or the limb will die. And then this part of the, the uh, bark will try to heal over 
but more than likely it will never repair. Thinly barked trees are easily damaged or killed when they're exposed to strong or hot direct sunlight. Sun damage can take years to heal and some of them never recover. And they can potentially kill a young tropical tree. So this is what kills the majority of the avocado trees that we put out. So what should you do about this? Well, monitor your newly planted trees for sun scald because it's not just the uh, avocado that can be affected, but also your new apple tree when you put it out. That bark is very thin. You can provide a shade such as this, or you can mo just move it uh, to a semi uh, sunny area. You can paint the trunk with a 50% mixture of white latex paint and water. For your pest problems, you can use organza bags or you can use netting. And these are the organza bag. You can order them from Amazon under uh, weddings. And to prevent damage to plants, uh, to your fruit, you can just clip the thorns off. Now, there are a few insects you want to take very seriously, and one is the leaf miner. The leaf miner, and this is she right here. The leaf miner lays an egg on the leaf. The larva will hatch and bore between the two layers, dermis and epidermis, of your leaf. And then it goes on a feeding trip until it finds its way to the edge of the leaf where it will then pupate out. And here's where another one came out. These galleries are a problem because as you can see in this photo, they are actually the most common entryway for a bacterium called citrus canker. And you also want to scout for the Asian citrus psyllid. This is the size of an adult. It's less than a quarter of an inch long. One of the telltale signs, though, is that it's always cocked at a 45 degree angle when it's feeding. So you want to make sure that you pay attention when these are visiting. These are the uh, nymphs of the Asian citrus psyllid and they look like aphids. But this white stuff is a waxy white uh, excrement. And that's your real telltale sign. That's, not, that's when you know that you definitely have psyllids. So what you want to do is uh, you want to act. Uh, these are insects that both uh, vector very harmful diseases for our uh, citrus industry. So one thing you can do is limit your nitrogen feeding. If you're just feeding your tree like crazy, it's going to be growing like crazy, putting on uh, innumerable leaves. Um, you want to spray all your new flush. That's your new growth. When it gets up about the size of a mouse ear, um, that's when the psyllid and the leaf miner will feed on it. Psyllid and leaf miners do not feed on mature leaves, only on the new flush. So that's all you really need to concentrate on spraying. And you'll want to use spinosad and rotate it with neem or horticulture oil and you want to do that about every seven days until your leaves have matured and hardened off. If you have a very large infestation of psyllids, where you, I, I've seen them, where it, you, it looks like it's thousands, you can just clip that off, just snip it off, put those in a Ziploc bag and seal it off. When it comes to protecting your fruit from pests like stink bugs or birds or curculio, you can use bags to exclude those pests. You can also use mosquito netting to exclude pests and it works very well. 
You can use sticky traps to catch them, but of course you also will be catching any of your beneficials around also. And this is another example of a sticky trap. This product, uh, it has a lot of different names, but you would recognize it most as tangle foot. It's a very sticky substance, which means you want to protect your tree trunk by putting a piece of linen, some type of cloth tightly around your trunk, and then you put this gooey mix on it. This is particularly good if you have ants, it's particularly good if you have leaf cutter ants because leaf cutters are very difficult to control. But if you annoy them enough, they will go somewhere else and leave your uh, fruit tree alone. And this is very annoying, but don't just leave it there. You're gonna to need to pay attention because the ants will literally build a bridge over this with dead bodies. And in fact, you wanna watch all of your sticky traps to avoid instances like this. This is a sticky trap that was discarded. You can see we have very beneficial animals on this sticky trap. We have geckos, we have anoles, we have a little uh, ribbon snake, and we have a coral snake. And yes, our coral snake is uh, venomous, but, um, their teeth are kind of like erasers. They're not going to bite you unless you pick them up. And I consider them beneficial because their diet is other snakes. Now we're going to go through our quarantines. One of them is citrus canker. And if you'll look at the photos, this is what you'll be monitoring your trees for. The brown spots or lesions. They have kind of an oily look or a water-soaked look. The spots are surrounded by a yellow halo most of the time, but not always. The spots can be seen on the upper and lower side of the leaf. So they'll be on both sides of the leaf. They'll also be rough, kind of like a scab. And you'll have similar symptoms on your fruit and stems. This is the quarantine area for Fort Bend County. You can see it's very large. So you want to be able, you want to scout your trees on a regular basis, looking for any signs of canker. This pathogen is very serious and it, it affects all citrus cultivars and their relatives. If you live in this area or have citrus or citrus relatives planted in your landscape, there are several maintenance and prevention strategies that we do recommend. Citrus greening is the other quarantine, and this is not just in Fort Bend Harris County. This is in Montgomery, Harris, Brazos, uh, Brazoria, uh, Fort Bend County, mm, and there's one other and I can't remember right now. So citrus greening is the most destructive disease for citrus. Uh, there's no control and no cure. It will destroy all citrus trees. The, the uh, strain we have is strain A. It affects everything, including orange jasmine. It's a serious threat to our uh, citrus industry. It will produce fruit that are misshapen. It will produce leaves that are mottled yellow. Now, don't confuse this with your nutrient deficiency. In nutrient deficiencies, right down the midrib, you will have a mirror on both sides of the midrib. So it's going to look the same on the right side and the left side. But in citrus greening, it's not mirrored. It is mottled, such as this leaf in the middle. It also will cause dieback and is most often you'll notice that it's on one branch. One entire branch will be yellowing and mottled and everything else will look fine. The infected insect will spread the disease and uh, once it picks up the disease, it will carry it for life. Citrus greening is spread by moving infected plants budwood, and even leaves, and fruit. 
So the practices we recommend are good sanitation practices. Rake up your fallen leaves, avoid wounding your plant, unnecessary pruning. Have good tree health, that's very important. And if you suspect that you are in an area where you might uh, get this bacterium, uh, the canker bacterium, you can spray it with a neutralized copper sulfate. That doesn't cure it, but it can keep it from spreading. If you suspect your trees are infected, you want to contact the extension office or the master gardener hotline. Do not bring the plants into the office. You want to take good photos and email them to us. Well, let's talk about uh, some fun things you can grow. Uh, very, very low maintenance, and that would be the pineapple. Now, a uh, pineapple is simple to start with. Uh, you can just um, twist the top out of a pineapple that you've purchased. You peel off some of the lower leaves, and then you put it in the soil. That's about the extent of it, and then it begins to grow. And the investment is really great because your mother plant will continue to give you plants again and again and again. So what do I mean by, by mother plant? Well, here is a, a pineapple growing. Now, a pineapple is in the bromeliad family and uh, they bloom much like a bromeliad. A little flower is down in the center cup and then it begins to grow. And here it is. Now this will turn, uh, it'll about double in size and it will turn a beautiful golden color. And it is so delicious. You can't imagine the difference between a pineapple you buy in the store and a pineapple that you grow in your own. It melts in your mouth. So when this is ready, you just give it a twist or you cut it off and then you keep your mother. Now she won't bear uh, another pineapple, but what she will do is she'll give you pups like this one. I harvested a pineapple from this one uh, about a month or so ago. I have two more plants here. I have another one growing in here. I have one here. Yeah, there's a lot. I twist them off and put them in another pot, such as this one. This is my old mother and I've, I've kept her and I've kept count and she has given me 25 plants. So 25 pups, it's, uh, it's an easy plant. I like the look of it. You treat them basically like a, a bromeliad, except that they like full sun. So you give them sun, you give them a little fertilizer and water, nothing to it. Now, another easy plant to grow is a papaya. Now the papaya can be uh, frustrating, but it can also be a lot of fun. This papaya last year was about 10 feet tall, really tall, and uh, too big, in fact, for me to take in during the winter. So we were gonna winter it through. And unfortunately, it did get freeze damage and kind of fell over on its side. And, and so here we are with this very short papaya, but you can see all of the fruit underneath. So it's loaded with fruit. Now the problem with a papaya fruit is it takes almost uh, six months for it to mature. So you wanna make sure that you have fruit early in season so that it's uh, mature and ready to be pulled by the end of your season before winter comes. These will be ready in a couple of weeks. The larger ones are already beginning to put a little orange flush on them. Another tropical that's extremely easy to grow is the dragon fruit or the pitaya. Very easy to grow. You grow it just like a cactus, which is with benign neglect. But here's the one issue. You have to have a good support system for it. You wouldn't believe it by looking at it, but this thing weighs a ton. It's very heavy. No matter what type of support I give it, it just keeps pulling over. Now I will be um, moving this into the ground next year and building a, a nice support of two befores in uh, wire. This is a bloom. Now this is a, has just started. The bloom will actually become maybe twice this size. 
And when it opens, the flowers are gorgeous. They're uh, about the size of a dish. They're, uh, they look just like the uh, night blooming cereus bloom. They're beautiful. So well worth having around if for no other reason than the blooms, but the fruit is delicious also.